another day to serve you and to honor you and to worship you. And we just pray, Lord, as we gather together to worship you, that you be preparing our hearts to receive the message you have for each of us, Lord. Father, our heart's desire is to grow in our relationship with you. And that's really the whole letter of James. It's all about maturing in the faith, growing up and in, in just drawing close to you. And help us to do that, Lord. We thank you for being our God. We just pray again that our worship would honor you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Manitowoc, 10 o'clock service. Okay, would you open the Word of God today to Psalm 62. Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed in the balances, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render to each one according to his work. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to James chapter 3 as we continue our study through this letter that James wrote to Jewish believers who were persecuted and scattered for their faith in Jesus Christ. And as I've said before, James is calling for these Jewish believers to grow in their walk with the Lord. He wants them to mature in the faith. And I think the Holy Spirit is also speaking to us along those same lines. He wants us to grow in our walk with the Lord. He wants us to mature in the faith. And as we've seen over the last several months as we've been going through these first three chapters of James, he's showing us what mature Christians look like. We saw in James chapter 1 that the believer and suffering, how we handle that is important that mature Christians embrace trials and they're on guard against temptation. In James chapter 2, we looked at the believer in service. And we saw that the mature Christian will demonstrate a heart of love and concern for the poor and disadvantaged, reaches out to them. And here in James chapter 3, we looked at the believer in his speech. And yeah, it's been difficult. The whole letter of James is a difficult uh, letter. But he's showing us that mature Christians have the power over their tongue and the things that they say. Now, let me clarify that. We talked about this last time, but we have the power over our tongue. Well, not really. The Lord does. It's all about surrender. We could say whatever we want. And isn't it amazing how fast we could say things? Someone says something to us, man, we're right there with something. Lashing out at them. We've got to be careful. We have to say, Lord, what do you want me to say? That's the key. The Lord has control. I guess we, in a sense, don't really. And as we finish up 
James chapter 3 this morning, we're going to be focusing on earthly or heavenly wisdom. And you think, well, you know, that's not talking about what we say. It's really more what we do, right? So how does this deal with what we say, the words we speak here in James chapter 3? I think that what's in our hearts is not only manifested in what we do, it's also manifested in what we say. And so a mature Christian will walk in wisdom, and yes, it will be seen in what we do, but it will also be seen in what we say, how we respond. You know, we've talked about wisdom before in James chapter 1, verse 5, where James said, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You know, you hear people say, I just don't know what to do. Have you prayed about it? You know, that's really a key, isn't that? Have you really prayed about it? Have you sought direction from the Lord? Or are you just like, from a human perspective, I don't know what to do. And that's the reality is, yeah, we don't know many times what to do. But God will guide us. He will show us. I have seen this over and over and over again in my life. That it's reach a point where I don't even know which way to turn. What do I do? And the Lord very wisely tells me. I love that about our God. If we are lacking wisdom, go to the Lord. He'll give it to you. It doesn't matter what situation you face, no matter how difficult it may be. And he'll give it to us, this wisdom, liberally. He'll give exactly what we need to us. And when we ask for wisdom from God, we need to do so in faith, that trusting that God's going to give it to us exactly what we need. And we talked a little bit about the difference between information or knowledge and wisdom. Information or knowledge is important. And I think for us as Christians, our knowledge comes from the Lord as we read and study His Word. You know, there's a lot of false information out there today. We have the technology, you know, with the Internet and Facebook, all this social media, all the information that could be given to us, but is it all true? And it's not. So how do we know what is true? And that's a big thing. You can't even say that what Christians speak is all truth. So how do we know what is true? Jesus said, Father, sanctify them by your word. Your word is true. That's the bottom line. That's the plumb line. We compare everything to the word of God because God's word is truth to us. Now, <clears throat> wisdom, different from knowledge, wisdom is taking that information and applying it to our lives. I'll give you this example. There were two teachers who were applying for the same vice principal position at a local high school. One had been teaching a total of eight years, the other for a total of 20 years. And everyone expected the teacher with greater experience to get the job. But when a decision was made, it was the person with eight years teaching who was chosen. And the teacher overlooked for the job complained bitterly. I've got 20 years teaching to her, her eight, he cried. I'm vastly more qualified. And the school board's, school board's reply went like this. Yes, sir, you do have 20 years teaching to her eight. But where she has eight years experience, you have one year's experience repeated 20 times. You know, how important it is for us to learn, to apply the, these things to our lives. Yeah, you have to have the right information, otherwise your response is going to be wrong. But it's not only having the right information, then it's applying that to your life. If you don't, it's meaningless. You know, wisdom isn't simply intelligence or knowledge or even understanding. It's the ability to use these to think and act in such a way that common sense prevails and choices are beneficial and productive. You know, it's, do you get wisdom from a textbook? Uh, sometimes, yeah. But it, wisdom really, that's just knowledge. It's not even wisdom. You have to apply that to your life. Here's the thing. You can hear you know, lectures on swimming. You could read books on swimming, and you can understand the buoyancy of water from observation. But until you jump in the water and get some experience, you're not going to have true wisdom about the water, and it may make all the difference between swimming and drowning. Experience is a good teacher. But here's the thing, it's not just wisdom, doing the right thing, it's knowing the right thing and then doing it. 
There are a lot of people that say, I just feel this is the right thing to do. And it's wrong. I, I, people tell me, I realize that the woman I'm in love with is not a Christian, but I just feel that God wants us to get married. Okay, now you're going by feelings. What does God's word say? That we're unequally yoked. And I can guarantee you that once you get married, that woman or that man that you married who went to church with you, did everything that you wanted, you thought, you know, they, they're a Christian. They don't know it, though, yet. Well, I don't know how that works, but, you know, it, they, they say goofy things like that. But once you get married, he or she is not going to church as much anymore. They, they don't want, want to be bothered with that. Be careful. God's word has told us what's right and what's wrong, and you need to apply it to your life. You need to live by it. That's important. We know what's true because God's word has shown us. So apply it to your life or your faith is empty. And there's really three points we're going to be looking here in James chapter 3 as we finish up this chapter this, this morning. The first is the application in verse 13 of James 3. In James 3 verses 14 through 16, we're going to see false wisdom from below. And then in verses 17 and 18, true wisdom from above. And keep in mind that our focus is our speech. What we say, and remember what we closed with last time, as James said, starting in verse 8 of James chapter 3, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men, who have been made in the similitude or in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And so with that in mind, and this is our background, let's pick up in James chapter 3, starting in verse 13, and let's look at the study, earthly or heavenly wisdom. James says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Again, knowledge or intelligence is the accumulation of information. And again, as Christians, we need the truth. We need the right information that's found in the Word of God. And there's so much false information that's being given today that you need the truth of God found in the Word of God. You know, one pastor was saying, you know, they, they kind of removed books from their uh, library. They don't want people bringing books into the church. Just bring your Bible. I thought, well, there's a safeguard measure, right? There's safety in that because God's word is true. Books you bring in could be good, but they could be bad. So you have to be careful. And look at what this world is saying in regard to what is right and what is wrong. Good is evil, evil is good. Immorality is promoted, godliness is looked down upon and mocked, made fun of. You know, you got a sport figure, you know, saying that, you know, he abstains from sex before marriage and they mock him, they make fun of him. Immorality is promoted. And what's tr even more tragic than that is that we see this happening in the church and for whatever reason, they start calling good evil and evil good. And, and maybe it's because they want to be accepted by the world, and that's a way to do it. That's a wrong way. The world's never going to agree with what we believe. That's the world. They're against God. And if they're against God, guess what? They're going to be against the servants, his servants. Others, you know, hey, I don't want to rock the boat because Why? Well, they fear man. What if we lose members of the church? What if this happens? What if I lose my friends? What if this? Forget about it, man. You fear man more than you fear God? Something's wrong. God has told us very simply what is right and what is wrong. 
He's told us how to get right when we've gone astray. And how, he's told us how to stay right, to do those things that would bring honor to him and really bless us. You know, Paul said in, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for reproof or for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God's word gives us all we need to live by. And we need to remember that. You know, Peter, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 said, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, Peter has given to us some very important information, and the key is, again, not only reading these things, but applying them to their lives, to believe what we are reading. What, again, you know, how important. And I realize you know, people have watered down the word of God. They ignore what God is saying. And as we'll see in our next point, that's a dangerous thing to do. If you go down that path, then the things that are manifested in our lives will not be good, including our speech, the words we say. But look at what Peter says. Peter tells us that grace and peace are increased or multiplied as we know God. Well, how do we get more of God's grace? I thought he gives us his grace. We're more aware of the grace that God has given to us, and we can enjoy that peace of God that's already there. You can't earn more God's grace. It's already there. We just miss it. We're not aware of it. I can honestly tell you, when I first got saved, I knew I was a sinner separated from God. I just didn't realize how bad of a sinner I was. Now, some 35 plus years later, as I'm reading God's word and I see the holiness of God, I see who I am and what he has done for me and the grace that he's extended to me. It's not that more of his grace was given to me. I'm more aware of it. What about his peace? His peace is there for us, isn't it? He's given to us his peace. Well, why don't I feel it? Why don't I see it? You're not aware of it. You're looking at the surrounding situation and that's determining how you're feeling instead of God who said that he would give us his peace through the most difficult of times. That's an intimate knowledge of knowing God. It's having a relationship with him. And the more we spend time with him, the more we're in prayer, the more we're with other believers, I think the more we'll understand his grace and his peace for our lives. And what Peter tells us that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You don't have to add this. You don't have to add that. He's given to us what we need. And how do we obtain these things that pertain to life and godliness? I thought the Lord gives us everything we need to live out our Christian life. It's simple. You don't have to make it complicated. Peter said, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What do we need for spiritual life and for that matter, physical life? We need Jesus. Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. All sufficiency in all things. Have you ever felt that you were not sufficient for the task that God has called you to do? All the time. <laughs> all the time. Why? Because we are apart from Him. It's only through Him that we're able to do all the things that we're doing. It's not about how strong we are how intelligent we are, how much power we have. It's about the Lord empowering us and giving us the words to say to do the things he's called us to do. 
have you ever looked at all the self-help books that are out there? It's incredible. And, and Christians even get into the self-help books. Why? Because they don't believe Jesus is sufficient. We need to add to it. I mean, you know, he was writing to people 2,000 years ago. How could this really apply to us today? You mean to tell me that Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, that knows the numbers of hairs on my head, that has not only created all the stars in the heaven, the billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of stars, and knows them all by name, can't give me information to live my life today? Not a very smart God, then. Of course he can. Of course he can. The whole problem with self-help books is the first word, self. I don't need more of myself. I need Jesus to help me, to guide me. Paul said in Colossians 2, Beware lest anyone cheat you, rip you off through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In any of your Bibles, does it say you're partially complete in him? Three-quarters complete in him. Nine-tenths complete in him. No, you are complete in who? In Jesus. We should take comfort in that. You know, God has equipped each of us to do certain things within the body of Christ. I helped Carl carry his guitar in here today. I said, ah, this is something you don't see too often, me carrying a guitar. Because I can't play guitar. I would love to, to play a guitar. And for that matter, and I'm sorry this is my problem, I cannot clap and sing at the same time. Nor can I start clapping because I don't even know when to start. I'm always on the off beat or whatever beat it is. <laughs> I can't do it. I fit, when someone else claps, and I'm not going to, I like to sing, but, and I can't, but I do. But you don't want me clapping. There were years ago, my wife, I was clapping and I was way off, and everyone was following me because I was clapping. And my wife's like, just stop. Just stop. You know, there's some things that we're just not equipped to do. But what God has equipped us to do, wow, let's use them. We're complete in him for the task that God wants us to do. And it doesn't matter what it is. So here we have you know, the right information because God has given to us all that we need to live out our lives according to the word of God. That's the information, the knowledge. But that's not what James is speaking of here, is it? Why did I mention it? Because without the right information, I know I've said this often, the application is worthless. And that truly is what wisdom is all about, that proper application of the information we have. You know, it would be like a doctor who smokes and eats junk food all the time. He has all the right information. He went to medical school. He's got the degree. He has the latest information on smoking and what it does and not eating right what it does to the body. Yet he's not applying it. That's wrong. That's foolishness. So James here is starting out with the application, you might say. In other words, a wise person will be revealed by how they live out their lives, the things that they do and the things that they say. And yes, the Holy Spirit guides us as we surrender our lives to, to Him. He uses our minds and expects us to get the facts and weigh the issues in the light of God's Word. But many times people don't even want to do that. I'll give you an example of what earthly wisdom and what heavenly wisdom is from something that happened to me a, a few years back, um, or a few weeks back, not a few, few years, it was just a few weeks ago. Um, I was taking Julie home from a doctor's appointment after her surgery, and I received a phone call on the church phone as we're driving home, and it gets forwarded to my cell phone. And the gentleman on the other end asked if he could ask me a question. I explained to him that I was in the car driving, but I do my best to answer his question. And, you know, it's usually a red flag, and I usually, when I'm at home, I pick up on this. You know, this is going to be a doozy of a question. I know it. Can I ask you a question? You're setting me up. But I wasn't thinking along those lines. I mean, Julie had her surgery. There's a lot going on. And so I said, you know, what's your question? And his basic question was, was this. Did I believe that God is manifested in three distinct persons? 
I tried to answer. He didn't give me a chance to answer. Because he then proceeded to tell me what he believed. And he said basically that in Genesis chapter 1, it speaks of one God doing the creation and not three persons. And I tried to explain to him, yes, in Genesis it also says, let us make God in our image. But, you know, again, he had all the answers. And I'm not sure what his point was, uh, but he was trying to deny the Trinity. And I tried to ask him if he believed that Jesus was God. And, whew, wow, things exploded after that. And then it struck me. A few years back, a guy called with the same question from work, which was where he was at, and he was getting agitated and yelling at me, too. It was the same thing. And I said, you know, are you the same guy that called me a few years back? Well, that just irritated him more. No, I'm not. How could you say that about me? I said, well, someone did the exact same thing you're doing from work, and it was the same question, basically the same response. And he was just getting madder because I wasn't agreeing with him. I said, look, we're not going to agree on this, and we need to end the conversation. There's no point continuing to argue this. I'm not going to argue with you. Let's just end it. And he was getting louder and louder. And I said, you know, I tried to explain that I was trying to answer his question, but, you know, he already, he already had his beliefs, and there's nothing that I was going to say that was going to change his mind. So what's the point? There's no point continuing on. Let's just end this. And he, it was sad because he kept arguing and arguing. And finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to hang up because there's no point continuing on. And let's just end this. And he was still arguing, and I just hung up, and that was the end of it. There's no point. You know, when I was younger, as a Christian, I would have fought with him. <sighs> I would have just continued on. I've learned there's, there's, no, there's nothing good that comes out of it. He was calling to try and tell me what I needed to believe. And the scriptures went against it. So I wasn't going to argue. And what saddened me, because if this wasn't the same guy that called a few years back, then there's two guys out there doing the same thing at work. And I'm sure they're not only calling me, and they get so agitated that I wonder what their co-workers are thinking. I don't know. It was a, just a very sad situation. And remember what James said about the tongue. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest the little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I tried to remove the kindle or the wood from the fire, and the only way I could end up doing that is by hanging up. And sometimes that's what you have to do. We need to be careful. You know, like I said, when I was younger, man, I would have fought this guy tooth and nail. But I've learned it's just foolish to try because you're not going to win him. He's called within his agenda. It's kind of like, you know, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses coming to your door. You know, the leaders, they're pretty much set in their ways. They're, you're not going to change them. But they always bring a, someone who is a learner with them. And I kind of, they don't come to my door that often anymore. They kind of know me. But I always talk to the learner. And I show them scripture. Say, what do you think that means? They try and get them to think. And they have to move on. And I see them in the car afterwards. He has to deprogram him from all the stuff I told him. Because the, the other person is thinking about that. Well, yeah, that's what this says here. If someone is not interested, guys, it's best to end the conversation because it's going nowhere. We need to understand this truth that true wisdom is applying the truths of God to your life, walking in the love of what you know to be true. Solomon said in Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's where it begins, honoring the Lord, respecting Him. Job tells us in Job 28.28, 28, And to the man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. 
and to depart from evil is understanding. You see, departing from evil, to know the Lord, to know what He wants for our lives, and to depart from evil. Don't go down those paths. We're to be doers of the word, James says, and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. In one of the, our Daily Bread articles, they said, every spring colleges and universities hold commencement ceremonies to celebrate the success of students who have completed their studies and earned their degrees. After the students cross the stage, these graduates will enter the world that will change them. Just having academic knowledge won't be good enough. The key to su success in life will be in wisely ap applying everything they have learned. Throughout scripture, wisdom is celebrated as a treasure that is worth seeking. It is better than riches. Its source is God, who alone is perfectly wise. And it is found in the actions and attitude of Jesus, in whom all the treasures of wisdom are found. Wisdom comes from reading and applying the scripture. We have an example of this in the way Jesus applied his knowledge when he was tempted. In other words, the truly wise person tries to see life from God's point of view and chooses to live according to his wisdom. What's the payoff of this kind of life? Proverbs tells us that wisdom is like sweetness of honey on the tongue. Blessed are those who find wisdom. So seek wisdom, for it is more profitable than silver or gold. And I guess, you know, the application is simple. Taking the truths of God found in the Word of God, applying to their lives so we can manifest the ways of God in our lives. James said, let him show by good conduct that his words, or works, excuse me, are done in meekness of wisdom. Yeah. Now as we read on, we'll see there are two kinds of wisdom, only two, worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. The wisdom from below or the wisdom from above. And as we read through these verses, don't miss the point that James is making. James tells us that this world contains these two different kinds of wisdoms, these two wisdoms that descend from two entirely different information streams. One from God and one from Satan. And again, the tongue of the believer can be filled with true wisdom from above or false wisdom from below. And wherever it's coming from, will be manifested in the things we not only say, but also the things we do. So let's look at this next point, false wisdom from below, starting in verse 14 of James chapter 3. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. So this is false wisdom from below. And he's coming down hard on those who are living according to this earthly wisdom. These immature Christians, carnal Christians, we might say. And this is what's manifested in their lives. Bitterness, envy, self-seeking. And they're the exact opposite in what James has spoken on regarding godly wisdom. And he's going to elaborate on that more as we read through this this morning, this true wisdom from above. Now, as I read through this section, it kind of reminds me of the guy who I was talking to uh, with the question, or so-called question he had, how he got angry at me and didn't agree with me. And the words here speak of someone who has a critical, contentious, fight-provoking attitude. And some may not like this, but James is speaking of human or earthly wisdom. And he's saying it's nothing more than demonic wisdom. That's pretty harsh, right? I mean, I don't think James would get invited back to speak at many churches today because he's pretty tough. He says, he speaks first of all of being bitter, which is kind of a sharp jealousy. It's cutting, it's destructive, no value to it. Demonic wisdom manifests the characteristic of having envy. In other words, being jealous and you want what others have, and you'll try to obtain it any way you can. And it's selfish, self-centered, self-seeking. It's all about you. And look at the picture that James has painted for us in regard to this demonic wisdom or this wisdom from below. We go from bitter jealousy, and out of that comes selfish ambition. So you promote yourself. You make yourself better than you are and better than others. You want people to look at you because you have all the answers. At least that's what you think. 
And James responds to those who feel this way. He says, do not boast and lie against the truth. In other words, your actions are showing where you are at. And as much as you're prideful in doing these things, you shouldn't boast about it because you're not in the truth. You're being deceived. You see, any so-called wisdom or philosophy of life that places self at the center of life and lives out to please self isn't a wisdom that comes from God or his word. It's the wisdom of this world that's rooted in Satan's lies. William MacDonald put it like this. He said, The worldly wise man is characterized by bitter envy and selfish ambition in his heart. His one passion in life is to advance his own interests. He is jealous of any competitors and ruthless in dealing with them. He is proud of his wisdom that has brought success. But James says that this isn't wisdom at all. Such boasting is empty. It is a practical denial of the truth that man who is truly wise is truly humble. Yeah, how true that is. And it's just the opposite of what God desires in our life. And yet, it's what we see promoted in the church today self. And you look at the church today, it has many of the same problems as the early church had. Why? Because we're no different. We're human. We have the same issues. And the early church had a lot of problems. You, you read the letters that James wrote or Paul wrote, and he's confronting issues, problems within the church. But it's probably on a larger scale today since there are more professing Christians today. And James spoke about this idea of being self-centered. And I'll share with you a couple things to show you where we're at, uh, first with church leaders and then with the church in general. One article said this, An up-and-coming young leader buys 30,000 Twitter followers from a dubious website. Think about that. Why do you want to buy 30,000 Twitter followers? So you could tell people, look at all these people that are following me. You bought them. Another seems to have a Wikipedia page set up for himself, full of the kind of obscure details you might expect on a full-blown celebrity profile. A third tells a friend just starting out in ministry that he should dedicate at least a third of his time to building your platform. And these are just three of the many stories I've collected over the last couple of years as my nagging concerns about Christian platform culture have slowly escalated. I've watched as self-promotion among leaders, speakers, and writers has gone from a sin of pride to an act of apparent necessity. I don't think it's okay. In fact, I think it's a growing fault line in evangelical Christianity, which has the potential to cause devastating earthquakes. A few years ago, Michael Hyatt's best-selling book called Simply Platform gave a slightly barefaced set of rules and guidelines to help people build their personal brand in the crowded online world. Trouble was Hyatt is a well-known Christian. He was the chairman and chief exec executive of theological publisher Thomas Nelson and used quotes from famous pastors in the promotion of his book. While he perhaps hadn't intended it to be used by Christian ministers, it had demonstrably taken its place next to the Bible on the bookshelves of some. Platform gives tips on how to raise your own pro profile, make your con content more so sought after, and ultimately see your bank balance adjust accordingly. That's perfectly fine if you're running a website for baking recipes or for trying to carve out a career as a political commentator. When your content is the gospel of Jesus Christ, however, and you've managed to convince yourself that in order to make him more famous, you'll have to do likewise, something's gone seriously wrong. Yes. What did John the Baptist say? I must decrease so he may increase. What we want to do is promote self, make ourselves so popular that you know Jesus could come along for the ride. Something's wrong with that, right? I hope you see it that way. Does the Bible say we're to promote ourselves? No, the Bible says die to self, right? We are to die to self, not promote it. That's worldly wisdom. It's demonic wisdom that's come into the church. And I'll just give you, I want to share a few of the eight signs that this next article says regarding selfie-centered Christians. And this is what it said. You are easily offended. When someone offends you, it should function as a red flag. I believe we get offended, generally speaking, for one of two reasons, discontent or pride. A selfie-cultured breed breeds defensive postures. Life is about us. When someone attacks our self-worth, we get defensive. 
If this is true, Christians should take notice. Having worked as an engineer and a church leader, I can confidently and sadly say Christians are the most defensive group of people around. It's strange, really. If you follow Jesus, you should be a fish swimming upstream, a countercultural model or, or our world needs, that our world needs desperately. Instead, Christians are more sensitive to others' remarks than most non-Christians. Why is this? Jesus was never offended. Jesus, you wouldn't find Jesus saying, I can't believe the Pharisees called me a heretic. Can you believe that, John? Can you believe it? He's ugly and stupid. Jesus wasn't offended because he was humble. Humility is the antidote to defensiveness. And it doesn't allow you to elevate yourself too high. It it helps you to consider other people before yourself. If you're a Christian, it's time to stop getting offended. Get off the high horse, start thinking about others. The second point is you never have or you have a never enough mindset. Brenny Brown in Daring Greatly says scarcity breeds a never enough mindset. Scarcity says you lack something. You aren't pretty enough. You aren't successful enough. You aren't smart enough and so on. Well, that's how they sell things, right? That's how the marketing world sells things. You need this. You need that. You aren't tall enough. You aren't this enough. You aren't that enough. Buy this and you will be. Even drinking beer will make you get pretty women, right? No, it doesn't. But we buy it anyway because they're good at what they do. Selfie-centered Christians focus on what they lack and what others have. They believe almost everything from success to money is finite. There's only so much to go around. The spotlight only shines so bright. What is the result? Selfie-centered Christians are tight-fisted with everything, from their praise to their pocketbooks. They are plagued by discontent, shame, and disengagement. Here's the most toxic part, though. Selfie-centered Christians believe the answer to their never-enough problem is abundance. If I lose weight, I will be enough. If I buy a new car, I will be happy. If I become a CEO, I'll be content. The opposite of never enough isn't abundance, it's contentment. Selfie-centered Christians have a better chance of catching a cheetah at full speed than catching contentment. Kind of puts it into perspective, right? Keep your eyes on God. He is the giver of all that we need. He never lacks. And when we find our worth in God, doesn't He fill every void, every insecurity and we have that contentment that we've been looking for in Him. We'll jump up to the fifth one. You have few meaningful relationships. This is shocking. According to a recent study, the average American has 338 Facebook friends. But here's the darker side to our counterculture. The average American has only two close friends. And 25% of Americans have zero close friends. None. 338 Facebook friends and no close friends? No, or maybe two? That's a dark time, guys, that we're living in. Don't we need each other to lean on? To be encouraged, to be corrected? and so on. What's the problem? The problem is that selfie-centered Christians aren't willing to pay the price for a meaningful relationship. They don't want that meaningful relationship because it costs too much time, too much energy to put into it. What do they want? They want a quick fix. And intimacy requires time. They want everyone to focus on them. And intimacy requires a give and take. They refuse to show weakness, and intimacy requires vulnerability. You need that deep, intimate relationship. And I think God requires us this way. He designs us for intimacy. And yet many aren't willing to pay for it, to put the effort in, the time in. The eighth point is you aren't compassionate or empathetic. You don't care about people. When scrolling through their Facebook timeline, 
Jill's rant about her teacher in an article about refugees received the same attention. We often equate clicking like to showing compassion. This is the tragic result of a self-centered life. We're desensitized to pain. We can't show compassion with a simple click. We need to be careful as Christians that we don't lose our compassion for people. That we actually reach out and touch people. Wasn't that a phone slogan? Reach out and touch someone? Look at the life of Jesus. Study the life of Jesus. He reached out and he touched people. He got close to them when no one else wanted to. He ate with sinners. And the you know the Jewish religious leaders were like, oh, look at him, man. He eats with sinners. That's horrible. I'm so thankful he does. Because apart from him, we'd be in trouble. And we need to be able to reach out to people to have compassion for them. And I think it's easy in the culture that we're living in to be Facebook friends. But can we go deeper? Can we be close friends with people? Because we need each other. We need to be, you know, liking someone's Facebook page or whatever doesn't mean you have a close relationship with them. I've had people that have posted things, and if you've done this, I'm not picking on you, but you know, if you don't send this article, you know, I'm going to cut you off from being a Facebook friend. Well, I, I never would post those because it just bothers me. If that's where our relationship is at, reposting a Facebook post, that's crazy. But that's what happens. Understand that Satan has introduced into this world a body of information that is filled with his lies. They're humanistic at their core because they place man and man's desires at the center of his existence. It's all about me. Why do you think the abortion laws are here today? Because it's me, and I, it's my body. I do with it what I want, and... If I want to have sex and I get pregnant, then I want to be able to do away with it. That's not your body. God has given you that body. That life that he has placed in your womb, it may have been conceived in fornication. But that's still a life. And you don't have the right to do with it with what you're doing. To destroy it. You see how important it is to take God's word and apply it to the things we face today. This is Satan's lies. The, this demonic wisdom is worldly wisdom. Paul says, where is the wise in 1 Corinthians 1.20? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And you look at the wisdom of this world and you go, are they crazy? Some of the things they say and do, you, go, you scratch your head. You can't mean that. But they do. But God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. Let's not go down that path. You know, I can't tell you the number of times in marriage counseling that this is the issue, self. It's all about them until, you know, I'll be more than happy to change when they change. Well, that's not the issue. The issue isn't about that person next to you. The issue is you. Well, what about them? God will take care of them. Their issue is not with you, it's with God. And I've used the illustration before. This is you in marriage, and this is your spouse in marriage, and look how far apart you guys are right now. And you know who's at the top of that triangle is God. So the closer you come to God, the closer you will come to each other. But self gets in the way, and you're so far apart because you're not centered upon God anymore. The wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and demonic, James says. It's in opposition to God. It's contrary to his word. It's a humanistic approach to life instead of a God-centered approach to life. It's earthly. What does that mean? It has this life in view only. 
And we see that in the church today. How many churches are excited? How many Christians are excited about the Lord's return? Well, yeah, I've got too much to do. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride. And you're busy? I mean, I'm busy too, but you know what? There's nothing that wants to stop me from going to be with him. But why is it not important? Because we're so concerned with the things of this world. It's earthly. It's sensual. It goes after things that, what, please the flesh. When you look at the number of Christians that are living to, together outside of marriage, why? Because they bought into this worldly wisdom that seeks after to satisfy the flesh. It's sensual. You know, I used to, I don't get many phone calls anymore from outside the church to marry people. But when they call me, they say, you know, would you marry me? I said, are you living together? And you might think, wow, you say that on the phone? Well, I'll either say it on the phone or I'll say it when I see them face to face. It's the first question I ask because it usually sifts through those that, you know, I'm not going to marry. And they'll say, well, yeah, we're living together. And so I won't marry you if you're living together. And if you separate over a period of time, yeah, then I'll marry you. But if I hear that you're living together and having sexual relations the day before the wedding, I'm not going to marry you. Thank you. They hang up. That's fine. But you say you're a Christian, you're not going to church, and you're living together. Okay, well, there's a big problem with that. That's sensual. God doesn't necessarily, again, we have the mentality, God wants me to be happy. No, God wants you to be holy. But the world wants you to be sensual. And to drive home the point, this wisdom is demonic, James says, or it's inspired by demons and not the Lord. And we as Christians can be influenced by demons. We can't be possessed, but influenced. And you can tell who they're following or what they're following by their actions and their words, if it's not according to the Word of God. There's only two points. It's either from God or it's from the demonic world. That's it. And what's the re end result of all this worldly wisdom? James says that there will be confusion and every evil thing will be there. God's not the author of confusion. And so this is not from God. This is from the devil. The confusion we see in this world today is a confusion brought about by the work of the devil, primarily through the work of the tongue, which he uses to spread his lies. And Satan's lies have produced every evil thing we see going on in this world, in contrast to the Word of God, which produces beautiful things. And I'm, I'm glad James continues on. He doesn't end here with, in this negative note. Look at verse 17 in James chapter 3. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, true wisdom from above in contrast to the false wisdom from below. And as we read through these verses, did you notice that the fruit that is born as we live out our heavenly wisdom with all meekness, first is pure, free of contamination. Our attitudes and our motives are pure in all that we do. It's peaceable. It's not looking for wars. It's not looking for fights. It wants to live at peace, but it will not compromise what you believe, what they believe. We seek peace. It's gentle. It, it responds in a, a gentle way. There's a sweetness to it. It's willing to yield this wisdom from above, that we're teachable. And he goes on and tells us that it is full of mercy or they minister to all, even those who mistreat them. And we see good fruits, which of course speaks of good things being produced in our lives. You know, remember what Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24 tell us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with all its passions and desires that fruit 
of the Spirit is love and manifested in many different ways. And then James speaks of being without partiality or not showing favoritism to people, dividing the church up. And lastly, James speaks of our faith being without hypocrisy or not to be two-faced, to be authentic in your faith. You know, hey, look it, I put on my Christian clothes to go to church and then as soon as you leave the door, all hell breaks loose, right? No. Now, isn't this wisdom from God much better than the wisdom of the devil, this earthly wisdom? Absolutely. Unless you're self-centered, then it's not. What do you mean it's not about me? It's not. It's about the Lord. It's about others. And God will take care of you. And James concludes, he says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I think what James is putting forth here in verse 18 is that the seed represents godly wisdom and its fruit is righteousness. You know, we go forth producing fruit in our lives, the right kind of living, using the godly wisdom, and that seed just reproduces peace in others as they come to Jesus, and they reproduce, and it goes on and on. Earthly wisdom is destructive. Godly wisdom is constructive. It builds up. Now, Paul in Romans 6.22 said, But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and to the end everlasting life. You know, look at what God has done in our lives. We've been set free from that old life that had us in bondage to sin. We were slaves to sin, but now we're manifesting the fruit to holiness and ultimately everlasting life with the Lord. Why go back to being a slave to sin and embracing the false wisdom from below, that demonic wisdom that has you in bondage. It's foolishness. Paul said in Romans 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We're filled with fruits of righteousness as we surrender to the Lord, as we seek the true wisdom from above. And I think we desire that in our lives, to be fruitful. But we have a choice. What is our hearts set upon? Because whatever it's filled with, whatever it's set upon, will overflow in our words and deeds. I'll share this story with you. It's kind of amazing when you think, when I read it, I, I was just blown away. But I'll share it with you. In 1845, Royal Navy Rear Admiral Sir John Franklin and 138 specially chosen officers and men left England to find the Northwest Passage. They sailed in two three-masted ships with the dawning names, the Erubus, the Dark Place, according to Greek mythology, through which souls pass on their way to Hades, which is kind of interesting. How would you like to be on that ship? And the Terror. Each ship was equipped with an auxiliary steam engine and a 12-day supply of coal, should steam power be needed sometime during the anticipated two- to three-year voyage. But instead of loading additional coal, each ship made room for a 1,200-volume library, an organ, and full, elegant place settings for all, china, cut glass goblets, and sterling flatware. The officer's sterling was of special, was especially grand Victorian design, with the individual officer's family crest and initials engraved on the heavy handles. The technology of the Franklin Expedition, says Annie Dillard, was adapted only to the conditions in the Royal Navy's officers' clubs in England. The Franklin Expedition stood on its dignity. The only clothing which these proud Englishmen took on the expedition were their uniforms and gray coats of Her Majesty's Navy. The ship sailed off amidst imperial pomp and glory. Two months later, a British whaler met the two ships in the Lancaster Sound and reports were carried back to England of the expedition's high spirits. He was the last European to see them alive. Search parties funded by Lady Jane Franklin began to piece together a tragic history from information gathered from Eskimos. Some had seen men pushing a wooden boat across the ice. Others had found the boat, perhaps the same boat, and the remains of 35 men at a place named Starvation Cove. Another 30 bodies were found in a tent at Terror Bay. Simpson's Strait had yielded an eerie sight, three wooden masts of a ship protruding through the ice. For the next 20 years, search parties recovered skeletons from the frozen waste. 
Twelve years later, it was learned that Admiral Franklin had died aboard ship. The remaining officers and crew had decided to walk for help. Accompanying one clump of bodies were place settings of sterling silver flatware bearing the officers' initials and family crests. The officers' remains were dressed in their fine button blue uniforms with some silk scarves in place. How sad. The Franklin expedition was a monumental failure by all estimations. It was foolishly conceived, planned, equipped, and carried out. The expedition itself accomplished nothing, yet it is universally agreed that it was the turning point in the Arctic exploration. The mystery of the expedi expedition's disappearance and its fate attracted so much attention in Europe and the United States that no less than 30 ships made extended journeys in search of the answer. In doing so, they marked the, marked, mapped the Arctic for the first time, discovered the Northwest Passage, and developed the technology suitable to Arctic rigor. It was upon the shipwreck of Rear Admiral Franklin's wisdom that um, Unmanson would one day stand victorious at the South Pole and Perry and Henson at the North. Similarly, the shipwreck of worldly wisdom how to motivate us to seek wisdom from above so we can wisely navigate through life. That is what James had in mind as he contrasted, contrasted the two kinds of wisdom. And think about it. What did Paul say? These things were written before him. These things in the scripture are there for us to learn the patience and comfort of God. We are to learn the thing, these lessons. Many Worldly examples, worldly wisdom that was used that ended in disaster, learned from. The godly wisdom that was learned and seen in victory, learned from. You see, they're there in the scriptures. Learn these lessons. Take them to heart. Apply them to your lives. And I'll tell you, if you take what James said here in verses 13 through 18 in James chapter 3 and apply them to the things you say and the things you do, you will see where your wisdom is coming from. You may not always like it. <laughs> that is the hard part, isn't it? We start applying these lessons and we go, ooh, I didn't do what was right there. I didn't say what was right. But we can learn from them. God's not there ready to stomp on us. He's there to build us up, to teach us lessons of faith, to help us to grow. You know, James said, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. He also said, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Oh, may we use the godly wisdom from above, apply it to our lives and grow in our walk with the Lord. John said in 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. May we be what God wants us to be, guys. May we do what God wants us to do. May we speak as God wants us to speak, to bring glory and honor to Him and to blessings to those around us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for these words here in James and the lessons that You have for us. And we see how important it is to seek your truth in your word, open up to us by your spirit, but not only that, but to apply these things to our lives, to use those lessons, to use your word to guide us in truth, to live out our faith, to say those things that would honor you and bless the people. Help us to do that, Lord. We have so far to go, but you never give up on us. And we thank you for that. Help us to always keep you first in our lives. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.